February 1, 1893, the Italian aristocrat and former mayor of Palermo, Emanuele Notarbatolo enters a first-class train apartment at Schiara Station southeast of Palermo. Once on the train, he puts his rifle in the netting above his seat, since as an honest politician with unblemished integrity, he isn't exactly a friend to Sicily's bandits. Unbeknownst to him, two men dressed in black wearing bowler hats have also boarded the train. Soon after, the train enters a tunnel between Termini and Travia. In the darkness, Notarbatolo is suddenly set upon by two men, one holding a stiletto, the other a bone-handled dagger. He fights back, but the blades keep plunging into him. His screams can't be heard by anyone over the roaring of the train through the tunnel. As it pulls into the Trebia station, the light exposes a blood-spattered carriage and the lifeless body of Emmanuel Notarbatolo. He was stabbed 27 times. This has been called the first of the Mafia's excellent cadavers. With the victim coming from the highest echelons of Sicily's elite, the murder will partly expose just how dangerous and connected these so-called men of honor are. These powerful Sicilian families will expand and rise, and for years the extent of their power won't entirely be known. Blood will paint the streets of Sicily, and later all the way to the USA. Their murderousness will know no bounds, but it will take car bombs and the deaths of politicians to really make the people realize just how big the Mafia is. The history of the Mafia is a complex thing, but here's the short version. In the mid-1800s, Sicily was far from a land of plenty and opportunity for all. Bandits formed alliances, they created codes of conduct, had a hierarchy, elaborate ceremonies, and did their business under a veil of secrecy. They were involved in extortion rackets, contract killings, and daylight robberies. It's said they started off by offering protection to the landowners who were making a killing from Sicily's most profitable export, limes and lemons. Some of those making the big bucks from citruses were made an offer they couldn't refuse. Take the case of Dr. Galati, who, when he came into the citrus business, discovered his warden was stealing the fruit and making money, money that should have been his. He naturally fired the warden, but then his new one was gunned down in no time at all. Galati went to the local cops for help, but they didn't provide much help. The doctor felt as if the police were not exactly on his side. He then got letters telling him to reinstate the previous warden, and when he refused, attempts were made on his life. He soon fled and left the citrus business behind. What he didn't fully understand was that his enemy was the burgeoning mafia. Those were the early days when rumors were first starting to brew about the Cosca, clans of men of honor. They insinuated themselves into a business, and then they'd end up taking it over or at least siphoning off much of the profit. Sometimes the protection they offered was actually from their own clan, a fact that was of course unbeknownst to the victim. Say no to them and one night while walking down a dark street you might find you have a date with a dagger or two. In those early days of killing, attacks would often come on desolate country roads where men appeared from nowhere blasting shotguns or in alleys with knives. The methods were basic, to say the least, compared to what would come. These men were called mafioso, which comes from a Sicilian word meaning something like to have swagger, to be brave and bold or what was called having rustic chivalry. One of those early bandits was named Salvatore Giuliano. He got on the authorities' bad side when he shot a cop dead during a dispute over his selling of black market food. This was during the Second World War when food was scarce in Sicily, and 70% of what was available came from the black market. Giuliano wasn't hated by the people, far from it, and in fact they thought him as kind of a Robin Hood-like figure. He kidnapped people, but for the most part he was good to his victims. He extorted the rich and he gave something back to the poor. But then on May 1st, when hundreds of peasants were celebrating Labor Day at the Portella della Ginestra as the newly elected communist leader started to speak to the crowd, gunfire rained down on them. Eleven innocent people were killed and 27 were injured. Giuliano, heavily involved in politics at the time, said he only wanted the bullets to go over the heads of the crowd. He unsurprisingly lost some fans after that. He was killed in 1950, allegedly in a gun battle. Prior to his death, he wrote this in a letter about a certain politician he'd worked with. He wants to have me killed because I keep a nightmare hanging over him. I can make sure he's brought to account for actions that if revealed would destroy his political career and end his life. Then news spread when his lieutenant, a man named Pisciotta, said his boss had received a letter before he was killed. A letter which he read that said bandits would be given a get out of jail free card if they committed that massacre. Pisciotta announced this while he was imprisoned with other bandits. He knew he was sitting on explosive info. It was assumed the letter must have been written by a very powerful person. Every day he knew he was at risk. He wouldn't share a cell with anyone but his father and he ate only food brought in by his mother. One day in prison he was handed something that he thought was medicine, but it was poison and he was dead within an hour. But who poisoned Pisciotta? Was it the mafia or the authorities? And who killed Giuliano for that matter? Some believe it might have been Pisciotta that did it, or that maybe he gave him up Judas style to the cops. If honor was sacrosanct to the mafia, backstabbing was contagious. After his death, Pisciotta's mother said, yes, it's true that my son will never open his mouth again, and already many people think they're safe, but who knows, perhaps other things may speak. 
That danger she talked about was from both criminal gangs as well as the authorities. There's a lot more to the story, but it gives you an idea of the cloak and dagger world the Mafia lived in. A world in which gangsters were very close to people in authority and sometimes there wasn't much daylight in between them, and if the authorities and politicians didn't play ball they were often disposed of. The gangs grew in size in the decades to come, almost completely taking over Palermo's construction industry. But with power and money comes rifts, and lines in the sand were drawn between Mafia factions. In the 1960s there was what was called the First Mafia War. Again, a long story. But let's just say it was an argument between two Mafia factions over a load of heroin that was shipped off to the US. A boss named Calcedonio de Pisa was accused of swindling another boss, although the Sicilian Mafia commissioner didn't find him guilty. In late December 1962 he got out of his car on his way to the tobaccoist and was gunned down in the street. The man accused of ordering that hit was killed soon after too. Now the war was really on. On February 12, 1963 a car bomb went off, but its target wasn't killed. In April, two men got out of an open-top Fiat and fired with machine guns at a fishmonger's shop. The fishmonger died, though he was likely also a hitman. Two others were hit too, one an innocent bystander. Men of honor didn't always hit the right target. Soon after, another boss was killed when he started his Alfa Romeo, and the bomb planted beneath it went off. Not long after, one of the men behind much of the violence, Angelo La Barbera, barely survived after being gunned down himself. The violence reached ahead on June 30, 1963. A car bomb exploded in a suburb of Palermo, not killing its intended target but killing seven men, police, and the army who had been called to the scene. In the end, 68 people were killed in this war, mostly over the lucrative heroin trade with the US. But far worse was yet to come. The bombing shocked the nation, but still, the public and most officials had just no idea how big the Sicilian Mafia really was. Plenty of people were put on trial after the car bombing, but not many were convicted. The Mafia was as strong as ever, and anyone called as a witness was told to keep quiet or die. The Mafia was so big that they started building their own heroin refineries in Sicily. They also sent their men over to the US to control things there too. Plenty of cash was made by criminals on the backs of addicted Americans, something that hasn't ever really changed. But of course, good things don't often last long for criminals, and soon factions were at each other's throats again. In the 1970s, the Second Mafia War began, which didn't really stop for two decades. It's thought that perhaps thousands of people perished in the fighting, including mafiosi and their families, the authorities, politicians, and innocent members of the public. Now we need to talk about the powerful boss Salvatore Rina, aka The Beast. By the time he came to hold considerable power and was known as the boss of bosses, he'd already killed many of his foes. Rina and others were part of what was known as the Corleonesi Mafia clan. This clan made a huge impact on the world for the horror they subjected so many people to, and when it came to murder they took things to another level. That thing called honor at times went completely out the window. Take the mobster named Tommaso Buschetta. At one point he was pretty much the biggest player in the drug trade, so he was in the way of Rina who wanted that top spot. Two of Buschetta's sons from his first wife went missing and were never seen again, believed to have been killed and their bodies dissolved in acid. Rina didn't stop there, ordering the death of Buschetta's brother, his nephew, his son-in-law, his brother-in-law, and four of his grandchildren. So much for men of honor who were supposed to follow a code that said no women or children would ever be harmed over business matters. Not surprisingly, Buschetta later turned on his enemies and talked to the authorities. Rina even got rid of competition from within his own mafia family. One such man was Filippo Marchesi. This guy was also a ruthless killer who once had what was called a room of death. If someone was invited into that room, it was very likely they'd be garroted. That meant being approached from behind by a man with a rope or a wire, who then wrapped it around the victim's neck and pulled with all his strength. The victim would then be chopped up and thrown into the sea, or sometimes an acid bath. But of course in 1983 when Rina started seeing Marchesi on the street, he was killed in exactly the same way. Rina also had two of Marchesi's nephews killed. Then there was Giuseppe Greco, another hitman with plenty of blood on his hands. He was sent after Rihanna's ally, Rosario Ricobono, after it was deemed that Ricobono wasn't of much use anymore. One day Ricobono received an invite to Michele the Pope Greco's estate, a lavish place where even more lavish parties were held. Ricobono turned up with eight of his men, expecting booze and a banquet of tasty Italian food. None of their bodies were ever found. It was thought that Giuseppe Greco, the nephew of Michele, had fed them to pigs. The dead being turned into pig food was not out of the ordinary in those days. In fact, some mafioso had pig farms specifically for this purpose. The pigs would be starved for days leading up to their human dinner, and sometimes the victims were still conscious while they were eaten. In the case of Ricobono and his guys at the party, they were all asked at some point to go have a quiet chat. 
Once out of sight, they were strangled. Members of his gang that weren't there that day were also killed, including Riccobono's brother who was decapitated. This was often the Mafia's modus operandi. If you take out a person's allies and loved ones, they won't come back at you in the future, and Rina cleaned up like no one ever did, much to his discredit of course. Killer and swine lover Giuseppe Greco was in turn killed, but a few years later in 1985. He was sitting in his home when he was shot by two people who were supposed to be his friends, but it was just business. Rina was worried that Greco was becoming too big for his boots. These were just a few examples of actual mafiosi murders. But the gangs also went after what they called excellent cadavers, just like Emmanuel Notarbatolo on the train in 1893. These people were the higher-ups that worked for the public, the cops who weren't on their payroll, judges and journalists, and the politicians who were serious about stopping them. A police chief named Boris Giuliano, who spent time with the FBI in the US, returned to Italy intent on investigating the burgeoning heroin trade. In 1979, he was shot three times in the neck and four times in the back as he sat in a bar waiting for his ride to take him to work. His killer, Leoluca Bargarella, who worked close to Rina during his reign of terror, was many years later convicted of numerous murders. Another top cop, Emmanuel Basile, was also shot and killed by the Mafia after investigating the narcotics business. During the same year Boris Giuliano was killed, the Mafia went after and killed even bigger names. One such person was Piersanti Matarella, who was the president of the regional government of Sicily. He wanted to investigate public contracts in Palermo, large pieces of pie that the Mafia had many fingers in. Mattarella even joked once, saying such an investigation could conclude with him ending up in a cement block. He also wanted to put an end to the close relationships the Mafia had with many corrupt politicians. It didn't end well for him. While traveling to Mass with his wife and two kids, a gunman approached the car and opened fire. His wife tried to protect him and was struck herself, and Mattarella died before he could reach the hospital. In 1982, the Mafia killed the general of the Italian army. Carlo Alberto Dalla Chiesa, who even though he walked around protected all the time, still could not avoid the hail of bullets that came from AK-47s. His wife and a police escort were also murdered that day. In 1983, a car bomb exploded and killed a well-known Italian anti-mafia magistrate named Rocco Chinisi. Two of his bodyguards were also killed, as was the concierge to his apartment who was unfortunate enough to be close to the car. The man who planted the bomb was none other than the pig feeder, Giuseppe Greco, who was of course killed soon after. Even with all the danger hanging over their heads, people working in anti-mafia units still pressed ahead. One of them was Judge Giovanni Falcone, whose death is arguably the most well-known of all Sicilian mafia victims. To some, after his death, he could have been Saint Falcone, a real Italian martyr. The Washington Post wrote after his death, he was the closest thing Italy had to a living symbol of resistance. In the 1980s, he led a campaign to take down big names in the mafia and he actually succeeded. In what was called the Maxi Trial in 1986, 338 people were sentenced to a total of 2,665 years in prison, with a few of those sent down being actual mafia bosses. But Rina, who had just a couple of years before the trial took place, had orchestrated the 1984 Train 904 bombing, which killed 27 and injured a further 267, didn't get put away. Rina had hoped the bombing would divert interest away from the mafia investigation, with him rightly thinking the government would assume it was the work of political terror. Rina was actually sentenced during the trial, but in absentia, meaning he wasn't there. He stayed in hiding and in 1992 the conviction against him was upheld. That same year, partly because of the many convictions, the Italian politician named Salvatore Lima was assassinated. He was driving with a chauffeur when a gunman on a motorbike appeared behind them. The gunman shot twice and hit the tires. When the car stopped, Lima tried to make a run for it but was shot in the back and killed. Falcone himself never moved anywhere without protection, although he should have had even more, since the Mafia would stop at nothing. Falcone was enemy number one, and Rina was bringing out the big guns. A mobster that worked under Rina was Giovanni Brusca. This man came from a family of mafioso, and he was a prolific killer, once saying he might have murdered as many as 200 people. It was he who was tasked with taking out Falcone. It wasn't going to be easy, and he would have to take the killing to a different level. Brusca and his men dug a tunnel under a motorway that they knew Falcone would be driving over with his entourage. They then placed 13 drums filled with 400 kilos of TNT and Semtex under the road. It would later be revealed that American Mafia boss John Gotti had sent an expert over to Italy to help them with the explosives. On May 28, 1992, in the early evening, word got out that Falcone was on the move. His entourage was followed by the Mafia, who all the time were in touch with Brusca at the detonation site in the hills. At 7.58 pm, the entourage reached the site, at which point Brusca hit the trigger. The first car was blown to pieces, killing all three agents inside in an instant. The second car, containing Falcone and his wife, was thrust violently against a wall. Both of them were sent through the windshield and died at the scene. 
Arena soon got the message and heard about the success, at which point he popped the cork on a champagne bottle and poured some drinks. The Mafia's greatest enemy had been slain. Just two months later, Rina had another formidable anti-mafia stalwart taken out, Judge Paolo Borsellino, a childhood friend of Falcone. Together they had many victories, but on July 19, 1992, Borsellino was killed along with five guys in his police escort. 100 kilos of TNT under his Fiat 126 was the cause of the deaths. A huge scandal followed though, since it was known that the judge was working on connecting the Mafia to powerful and influential people in Italy, and it was revealed that they and some police were on the Mafia's payroll. His little red notebook, called the Agenda Rosa, was not with him when he died, even though he took it everywhere with him. But who had made it go missing? It could have been any official written about in the pages of the book, but it was eventually revealed that before his death he was being watched by Italy's civil intelligence service, the SISDE and that he might well have been killed because he knew about the SISD's connection to the Mafia, as well as the Mafia's friends in politics. Years later, Rina would say he'd been made Italy's scapegoat, and that it was actually the people in high places who were behind the bombing. Brusca was eventually arrested seven years after the death of Falcone. He was certainly a man of few morals, once remarking how when he went over to the US to work he didn't like the different mentality and the fact that they didn't carry out massacres. This was a mean man, and he's still in prison today. Just before he hit that trigger on the device, the man shouted, Vi, vi, go, go, was Nino Gio. After his arrest, he denounced what he'd done. The last thing he ever said was the admission that when he joined the Cosa Nostra, he lost all values and honor, and the only thing he became was a monster. As for the beast Rina, he evaded the cops until 1993 when he was finally arrested. Rina was handed 26 life sentences by the courts, and he'd served most of the time in Italy's own kind of prison hell, a very lonely isolation cell. It was said he ordered 150 murders but you could easily double that figure. This is what the Mafia expert John Dickey said about Rina in an interview. He assassinated his rivals, he killed all of them, hundreds of them. He literally ethnically cleansed them out of Palermo. Rina died in prison in 2017 at the age of 87. The Sicilian Mafia is very much alive, but it seems for now the days of mass, sometimes indiscriminate murders are over, at least for now. Now you need to watch what does the Mafia even do anymore, or have a look at crazy Italian Mafia crimes.